Welcome to Structure Fishing, I'm Jim Shell. This is going to be part two of the Structure Fishing Workshop Controls and Tools. But let's recap what we learned so far in part one, the basic movements of the fish. We said in the basic movements of the fish that the home of the fish is deep water. This deep water is a sanctuary he has from changing conditions up above, from changing weather and water conditions. And the bigger the fish gets and the older he gets, the more reluctant he is to leave this deep water sanctuary. When he's, when he's in his deep water sanctuary, he's very dormant and non-chasing and very difficult to catch. But we're safe because the fish don't stay in their deep water sanctuary all the time. They become active once or twice a day and may move towards the shallows. We're saved again because they just don't move haphazardly in any old direction. They follow the features of the bottom, which we call structure. And how far they move on this structure is controlled by the weather and water conditions that are present at the time. So if you and I want to consistently catch the fish, we have to control. And this is what we're going to talk about today. We have to control. We're going to tell you what we need to control while we're on the water to catch that fish successfully. So with that, let's begin controls and tools. All right, what can I control to catch a fish? Well, before we get into it, let's quickly talk about the things that are out there that are gimmicks that aren't controls or tools, but yet a lot of fishermen, uneducated fishermen, think that these things are. I grew up in the uh, mid-late 80s when a lot of these gadgets, gimmicks I should say, first came out. You have your pH meter, your color selector, your fish attractants, and I think that last one there is uh, something fairly new in the last five years or so. It emits sounds that are supposed to gimmick uh, feeding fish to get fish into a frenzy. These are nothing but gimmicks. And it, it, it's just someone getting rich off the uneducated fishermen. And hopefully by the end of these, this discussion on controls and tools, I think hopefully you'll agree that these are gimmicks. And uh, hopefully we're going to educate you so you know not to waste your time and money on this stuff. By the end of this workshop and the end of this segment of controls and tools, I hope that I've convinced you or you open your mind to believe that. All right, Buck Perry says that we have five basic controls. We have action, color, size, depth, and speed. You think about it, that's a lot of things to go over. A lot of different possibilities and combinations. Uh, it could be almost endless. But let's take a look at each specific control and see if we can't narrow that down a bit. All right, first one we're going to talk about is action. And when it comes to action, there's really nothing you and I can do about it. Most all lures have a built-in action, and we really can't change that. You know, some crankbaits are going to have a tight wobble. Some crankbaits are going to have a more loose wobble. Uh, the same thing with like a blades on a spinner bait. I mean, really nothing we can change that action. Action's really going to be built into the lures that we use. <clears throat> the desired action in shallow water is going to be a tighter wiggle, and the deeper you go, it's, we're going to be looking for more broader, wider action. <clears throat> action should be treated as speed. Without speed, there would be no action. You, any lure you throw out there, if you don't move it, you've got zero action. So action is really, if you think about it, it's going to be a speed. So I think we can eliminate action. All right, now we have color, size, depth, and speed. Let's talk about color. This is one of my favorite things, subjects to talk about. But real quick, we'll talk about when you have bright conditions, you want to use bright colored lures. Silver, whites, bright colored lures. When you have dark conditions, you want to go with dark colored lures. And when there's neutral colors would be like gold, brass, and yellow. And um, when it comes to colors, that's a, a guideline, but I personally feel that color is one of the most overrated controls that there is. Uh, I, I'm one of these people that don't believe in color at all. The only thing I believe about color is if it gives you confidence. If you have a special color, a favorite color of yours, by all means use it. By using your favorite color, what is that going to do for you? It's going to give you confidence. When you have confidence when you're fishing, you're going to be doing things automatically, doing things right. But I look at color as color makes fishing fun. You know, if I catch a couple of bass on, uh, 
I think it happened on one trip years ago. Uh, fish with my friend Bob. The headwaters of Lake Wisconsin, and we were uh, trolling uh, uh, shallow spoon plugs. We were about six, seven, eight feet of water, and I had a pink spoon plug on. My friend Bob didn't have a pink one on, and I happened to catch two or three fish in a row before Bob caught one. So, and it's not because he didn't have a pink one on. It, it's just I happened to be in position. I just happened to, you know, flip a coin three times. It might land on heads three times. I caught three fish. But it made it fun because I told Bob, you don't have a pink 250 spoon plug. <laughs> That's what they're hitting on, Bob. That's how I look at color. It just makes fishing fun. If you have a favorite color, use it because it's going to give you the confidence. But if you're uncertain about color, bright conditions, we want to use bright colored lures. Dark conditions, you want to use dark colored lures. And then you've got neutrals like your yellows and brass that will uh, work uh, under, under any condition. But I personally, if I go out fishing with someone new or, or is hung up about color, I will change my color lure throughout the day just to prove a point that color doesn't really mean much in fishing. Um, that's all I got to say about color. So we can eliminate color. Now that leaves us with size and depth and speed control. So let's go with size. Uh, when we talk about size of lures, we want to, you know, we got to obviously use weights and sizes of lures, which will allow you to present your lures correctly for what you're trying to accomplish. For example, if I'm trying to fish a spot that's uh, 30 feet deep, you know, uh, end of a bar for walleyes, I'm going to cast to it. Well, I'm not going to use an eighth ounce jig head in 30 feet of water. It's just going to take too long and that jig is going to fish too is going to sink too slow and when it does get to the bottom I'm really not going to feel it. So you need to use size lures for what you're trying to accomplish. Now in that 30 foot break line I'm trying to cast to I'm more than likely going to use at least a 3 8 ounce jig or a half ounce jig something that's got some weight to get me down to 30 feet. Now if I'm casting the shallows and I'm fishing for panfish or uh, fishing shallow water yeah, then I want to use that eighth ounce jig head or quarter ounce jig head. Uh, but you got to look at size as to what you're trying to accomplish, the depth you're trying to fish, and you got to use the right size lure to get down deep. Now, uh, here's a good picture here <clears throat> about size. A fish will try to eat anything the same size he is, or even bigger, as you can see in this example here. Um, if you put the, the lure in front of the fish, size really isn't that important. You, we've all seen pictures, or it's happened to us many times, where we've caught a lure, I mean a fish that was the same size as the lure. And it also happened to everyone too, that you're fishing uh, for panfish, you get a little, small little lure on, and you end up hooking a really big uh, northerner muskie. Just happened to me this past fall when I was crappie fishing. I was using uh, like a 16th ounce jig head, and I hooked a, it was, probably, it was an over a 40 inch muskie. Uh, but just, just to, goes to show you that size really doesn't matter much as far as catching fish. Um, although I believe that most fishermen tend to fish with lures that are too small most of the time. But uh, when it comes to size of lures, you want to focus on it, what am I trying to accomplish on the water. Um, you know, I'm fishing an uh, eight foot spot. Um, well, I'm not going to be throwing a one ounce jig head if I'm fishing eight feet of water. You know, so just think of size as to, you know, what I'm going to use to, uh, account, what I'm trying to accomplish that day. And don't you know, think that you're fishing with lures too small or especially too large. What's one of the problems that I see that most fishermen tend to fish with lures that are a little bit on the small side. All right, that's enough with size. So we can eliminate size. So that leaves us now with two controls we have to focus on, depth and speed control. And these are the two things that we need to really pay attention to. We have to control our depth and control our speed. All right, now when it comes to speed, this is just a, a general guideline. But when the water is colder, you typically want to go with a slower fish. And when the water is warmer, you want to go with a faster, faster uh, speed. A fish, as you know, is a cold water creature. His, his body temperature is the same as the water. 
When it gets colder, his body functions and his metabolism slows down. And when it gets warmer, his body functions and metabolism speed up. So in colder water, for the most part, he's going to be a little, little bit slower and looking for a bit of a slower speed. And in the warmer seasons, when the water is warmer, you want to go to a faster speed. But you always have to check it out. There's been pet, uh, plenty of uh, times where I was fishing in the colder season and um, they wanted a faster speed. And in the summertime, there was uh, several times where they wanted a slower speed. But speed is something we have to definitely check it out. And this is, a, here's, we got another buck says up here, very important. All fishing successes and all fishing failures must be answered in terms of depth and speed control. Very important. I, I think this is one of the most underrated Buck Says statements that are out there. I mean, it's so important, i got to say it again. All fishing successes and all fishing failures must be answered in terms of depth and speed control. You get the right depth and the right speed, that fish doesn't have a choice but to take that bait. I personally think half of the time, if I don't make a good catch on the water, I think it's half of the time, if not more than half the time, it's because I didn't have the right depth and the right speed on that day I was fishing. Uh, I'd like to tell you a, a couple of stories about depth and speed control. I mean, I read about Buck talking about depth and speed all the time, but when you're on the water and you experience uh, a good lesson on depth and speed control, it really sinks home and, you, and it's a, something you'll always remember and keep in mind. Uh, here's a picture of me uh, fishing uh, Coffeen Lake in central Illinois. It was a very fantastic bass lake. Uh, but I was out there with a couple of friends of mine, uh, two boats. I was fishing uh, with my friend uh, Gordon in my boat and uh, my friend Bob was in a different boat. And it was in the middle of summer when you think you'd have, you know, peak summertime conditions is what we had out there. And we were fishing about half a day and we only caught two or three bass. Uh, you know, the fish were deep. They should have been very active, summer patterns there, and uh, with the depths involved and the speeds involved, the best way to get that depth and speed was on the troll, which we'll talk about later on in the workshop here. So I was trolling a uh, deep diving crankbait, and we caught a few fish, and I was really surprised that, boy, we've got peak summer conditions, the weather conditions aren't too bad, I can't believe that these fish aren't moving or aren't active. So I had my lure in the water, and the next bar I wanted to check out wasn't that far away, so I left my lures in the water, and at that time I think I was running a 15 uh, horsepower outboard, and instead of reeling it up and shooting over to the next spot, I left the lures in the water and I cranked up that 15 horsepower nearly full throttle to get to the next spot. And I'm going full, almost full throttle with that 15 horse, which I'm guessing was probably over 10 miles an hour, all of a sudden the fish took. And I thought, oh well, wow. I've never caught fish going that fast before. I've caught fish going fast. Most people think three to four miles an hour is fast. I mean, I've caught fish, you know, consistently in the summertime. It's not unusual to get them five or six miles an hour. But I had my 15 horse just about nearly wide open, and it sort of surprised me. Wow, fish that was moving. I must have been going, I'm guessing, approximately 12 miles an hour, and that fish hit. I thought, wow. Got him in, released him. I thought, well, this is a little bit unusual. Let me turn around and make that same pass again and just see if it was a fluke. Ripped the motor open right open again and went over to the tip of that bar again at about 12 miles an hour and bam, got another fish. It was a speed control. I wasn't going fast enough in that day out there and it really taught me a lesson. Once I realized that these fish just wanted it flying by them, I think we ended up catching something like 20 fish in the next couple of hours where the previous five or six hours we caught two or three fish. And then I saw my friend Bob uh, a little bit later, and I called him over, and I told him the story of what happened. And first he said that he only had, I think, one fish he caught. When I told him that, you got a really super fast speed. I'd never seen it this fast before. So he did the same thing, and he was catching fish as well. But that's one story about how you got to go really fast at sometimes to uh, get the fish. And when you experience that on yourself, you know, it really sinks in. Uh, another story for you. Uh, many of you are familiar with Don Dixon, and in one of Don Dixon's seminars, he tells this story when he was fishing with Buck Perry at the headwaters of Lake Pepin. They were just going back probably in the early, mid-70s, I believe. They used to do on-the-water schools uh, up in uh, Lake Pepin in the spring, 
you know, take you know, classrooms and take you out on the water. And uh, Don and Buck got there a couple days before the uh, school, the program was going to start, and he went fishing to find the fish. So when they came to on the water time, they no good idea where the fish were at. And in the springtime in Lake Pepin, uh, the big species up there other than walleye are white bass. And, and back then you'd get some of the biggest jumbo white bass you've ever seen. I mean, they were uh, two pounds would, would be at, at times considered a small one. They, they'd get them up, you know, two and a half pounds average, you know, some pushing three pounds. But anyway, Don and Buck are in the boat fishing and, and Don tells this story great. And uh, there's one section that, you know, Buck felt pretty confident that the fish, the white bass, should be in this section. And it was post-pond. It was a uh, warmer spring, uh, so the fish were post-pond, and they trolled this section back and forth, didn't get anything, and then Buck looked at Don and says, you know, our speed is too fast, we have to slow it down. So now they went casting uh, quarter-ounce uh, jig heads with uh, twister tails. And, you know, they, I think the way Don tells the story, the structure was about a quarter mile long that they were fishing. So they started with quarter ounce jig heads going down this section, not even a strike a bite. They made a second pass, quarter ounce jig heads, nothing. And Dad at this point wanted to move on and try some other stuff. He, you know, thought, well, the fish aren't here, Buck, let's move on. And Buck says, no, nope, I know these fish are here. We're, our speed is off. So then he says, let's change the eighth ounce jig heads get a slower speed. So they start casting eighth ounce jig heads and they made a pass through this long section. Like I say, it was a quarter mile long, eighth ounce jig heads, a little bit of a slower speed, nothing. And now this time Don is like, Mo, I want to get, I want to start catching some fish. And he's like, you know, Buck, you know, let's move on. And Buck's, <laughs> Buck looked at that and says, no, Donald, they got me mad now. <laughs> So Buck went back and he made another pass with the eighth ounce jig heads and they're going halfway through this thing. All of a sudden Buck gets a fish, nice chunky, you know, two pound plus white bass. Let it go, throws right back in, gets another one, gets another one. And on either the third or fourth fish that Buck caught, Don finally stopped and says, Buck, what are you doing? <laughs> and Buck laughed and he goes, I was wondering how long it was going to take for you to ask me. And he says, Donald, watch. And typically when you fish a, you know, this kind of situation, like most of us would throw that eighth ounce jig head down and we'd bump, bump, bump. Really slow like that, bump, not catch anything. And he says, uh, Buck said, Donald, watch me. And he made his cast out there. And it was such a slow speed that he was just, wasn't even jumping the bait. He was just crawling it, dragging it on the bottom ever so slow. And once he got that speed that slow, a white bass would, big white bass would scoop it up and he'd get it. And then Donald made his first cast and just barely moved, wasn't even jumping, it barely moved it. And every cast he caught a fish. He said that they were in there so thick, every single cast. And Donald said he got to the point where he felt so confident that there were just Tons of them down there. I think he said they caught in excess of 40 or 50 fish. Every single cast, they didn't miss one. That that's boy, they got to be in there so thick. I'm gonna make a you know my regular cast. Cast go down there and just bump bump like this. They wouldn't take it. He make the next cast and just dragged it on the bottom and they smacked it up like that. After they were done catch, catching, I think he says that they caught over 100 fish, if not more, and these were all two pound plus white bass. And when they were all done, Buck Perry looked at Don and he says, Don, I bet you will never, ever forget this lesson you learned today on depth and speed control. And Don says, Buck, you're absolutely right. I'm never going to forget that. I love that story. But that shows you that the two extremes, about super slow where you're barely dragging it, to the other extreme about going at least 12 miles an hour. And I've heard of stories of... of, of of others, you know, structure fishermen catching bass, you know, in excess of 15 miles an hour. But I, two good stories to show you the importance of depth and speed control. And like I said, I'm a per personal believer that half the time I go out there and I don't catch fish, it's because my depth and speed was off. So as we said, when it comes to depth and speed control, we must check it out. Right? Every time I'm fishing, I'm always changing my speeds, and you should be too. Always 
check, change your speeds out. All right, so that leaves us with depth and speed being the two mo most important controls we need to do. Let's do a re quick recap on controls. All right, action, we said you got to treat it as speed. Color, if you're into color, light colors for light conditions, dark colors for dark conditions, and you got neutral colors. Size, you want to treat it as depth. You want to use the right size lure to get the right depth that you're trying to work. Speed, you have to work it at temperature, but you always got to check it out. Slower speeds when it's cool, cooler out, and faster speeds when it's warmer out, but you always want to change your speeds, vary your speeds all day long to see if there's a preferred speed that the fish are looking for. Very important. In depth, obviously, you got to all work it correctly. You got to start from the shallows and, and just gradually work that structure, which we're going to go in more detail later. But you got to check out your depth and speed and just keep on working down that structure and then arrive at the fish.